This is the Generation 3 flat pack stove from Sea Stoves. If you're interested in hearing more about this stove, keep watching. All right, before we get started, I thought I'd just give you a little background on how I happen to have this stove in my possession. So I, I was aware of this stove and I knew that it was available in stainless steel and titanium from looking at the Siege stove website. Honestly, I didn't think it was something I'd purchase for myself. Well, my opinion has changed. Now, I don't own this stove. I didn't pay for it. It was actually loaned to me by a friend of mine. He purchased it didn't have the time to take it out and play with it. So he called me up one day and said, would you like to have it for a while and test it out and maybe do a review on it? And I said, sure, why not? Uh, of course, a while turned into quite a few months now, mostly because of the fire ban here in Nova Scotia, which has been lifted today because of heavy rains overnight. In any case, this was sent to me by my friend. I did not pay for this, but it was not sent to me for free by the company. Uh, spoiler alert. I'm going to buy one. That's what I think about it now. Having tested and played with this all summer long, I think it is something I really want to have for myself. And I think you will too. So what I'll do is I'll take it apart, show it to you what it's like in its unassembled state. We'll show how it goes back together. And then we'll talk about its specifications. And then we'll talk about its modes of operation. All right, to assemble the stove, I'm going to work on my little log bench that I made out here in the woods, and I'm going to be using my kneeling pad as a flat surface. So I don't have this in any type of packaging because what you get when the stove arrives is just a small cotton sack with a drawstring on the top, sufficient for transport, but not for long-term carrying it around. So I did make a little envelope to go with this that I'll be giving to the owner with the stove once I return it to him after making this video, but uh, it wasn't make any sense to show you that one. I, maybe I'll make a different one for the stove when I purchase my own. All right, let's get started. So what do you get? Well, to start with, this should look familiar. This is basically the siege stove. If you were to buy the original siege stove, the four cross member components. And I have a review on the siege stove in stainless steel where I created a, an, a, a, a stove from an IKEA utensil strainer and also a couple of tin cans and made a wood gas stove. So these are the two bottom members with the very very sharp teeth on them and these are the two top members that will cross over and be on top of the stove. So this is the foundation for this stove but you can use them with again with any number of, of cans, coffee cans, any metal can you want, paint cans, to create a stove of your own. You don't have to use the rest of the stove but let's put it together and I'll show you the rest of the stove because once you see this go together I think you will want to. So what you get for the rest of the stove is the fire grate and four identical sides. Now I mentioned this is in titanium, but it is also available in stainless steel. Now, uh, this is not only designed, but completely manufactured in the United States. This is not an offshore production, any of it. And the entire stove is made from a high quality stainless steel. Now, as I put this stove together, I just want to point out that it's dirty. <laughs> I just had it assembled a little while ago and, and had a fire in it so that I could make myself some coffee and I didn't clean it before starting this video. So let's start by putting it together. As I mentioned, all four sides are identical, so it doesn't matter where you start. Grab any two sides, hook them together with the tabs on the edges there, as you can see. All right. And if this looks familiar, it's pretty much identical to putting together the Emberlet stove. And yes, it's a little bit more work than a hinge stove would be, but not significantly, honestly. It's worth that little bit of effort. So, all right, there's the, the stove functionally assembled. And if I turned it upside down, it would look a lot like an Emberlet. Well, the first thing you're going to notice, though, is that there are no feed ports on this stove. It is wider at the top than it is at the bottom, so it narrows as it goes down, and all four sides are identical. So I've got that assembled, put the base plate aside. Now take the two cross members, put them together, set them down, take the stove, and there are two ways that you can lay the stove on top of the cross members. You can do it perpendicular or across the stove, across the sides, or you can do it corner to corner. Uh, either way is perfectly uh, correct. I like using it corner to corner. I think it just makes it a little bit more stable in its width. Now I just drop this in and that literally drops into place. Take my top pieces, 
And there are notches here on all four sides that will allow this to drop into place. Now, this one is, the stove is slightly warped, and I'll talk about that in a few minutes' time. So you do have to do a little manipulation to get the cross pieces on after a little bit of use. Um, there it is. That's the complete stove assemble. And its simplicity really does not speak to how well this works. So what I want to do now is I'll give you some specifications for the stove, and then we'll talk about how it can be used with a variety of fuels. Okay, so I have my uh, cheat notes here just to make sure that I give you the accurate information. And of course, as always, I'll be putting the specifications and all the other information for the stove, where you can purchase it, and all that in the video description underneath the video. But let's start. So right now, weight. Let's start with the weight. So this weight of this stove comes in at 11.6 ounces or 300, uh, 328 grams, and of course that's the titanium version. If you did want to save a little bit of money, then you can buy the stainless steel version, but you're doubling the weight, 21.3 ounces or 604 grams, so it's up to you. Either one will be just as effective functionally, it's just the stainless steel one will be twice the weight of the titanium one. Okay, height. Total height of this stove, just the stove itself, not with the cross members, is seven and one eighth inches or 18.1 centimeters. The width across the top, and since it's a square, it doesn't matter which way you go, side to side, is five and one eighth inches or 13 centimeters. The bottom plate, because as I mentioned, it narrows down to the bottom, so the fire grate itself is four and uh, one quarter inches or 10.8 centimeters. It has a burn chamber depth of four and a half inches deep, which is 11.4 uh, centimeters. I just want to mention something here. That is almost virtually identical to the firebox stove. So this stove will hold as much wood as a firebox stove. It's, I don't, couldn't see it, and comparing the two of them side by side, I couldn't see any functional difference in, in between the two stoves. Now, I mentioned that it has no feed ports on the side. All four sides are identical without feed ports. They just have these three rows of holes. Uh, that's because you really don't need them. Look at the, the standoff, how high the, the top cross members, the pot stands, are off the top of the stove. I, I wondered about that. It, it works very well to not only reduce the amount of smoke that this stove might otherwise produce, but it allows me to throw sticks on from all four sides while there's a pot on top of it. So it uh, it is not hampered in any way by having no small stove. In fact, I can put some pretty long sticks if you go in at an angle and still have a good sized pot on top. Okay, so this does come with a few, or there are, I should say, there are a few accessories that you can get for use with this stove. I, didn't, I don't have any of them. Uh, there is a set of um, toaster racks. In fact, I think I'm going to get those when I, when I purchase my own, and so in a future video you'll see the toaster racks being used. There is a folding grill, so it's like a two-sided grill that you can put a piece of toast in or whatever, and uh, toast on top, or meat, I guess, on top, because on the sides you can put the toast, and a little fire poker. And the fire poker might be useful, I guess, uh, and I'll talk more about that in a few minutes, because I expect that having looked at the fire grate and the small number of holes in it, you're wondering, will this clog up with a, a lot of ash over time? And I'll speak to that because I did an extended burn test that, uh, you know, because I wanted to know that for myself. All right, so let's talk about use with different fuels. So to begin, you can use it with either a top-down burn or a bottom-up burn. Either is functionally uh, just as effective. You can do a Swedish fire torch where you'll take a log of near diameter, split it in four, face the corners outwards like the Steve does with the firebox stove, and you can do that with this stove without any issues. Uh, you know, one thing I, I, I would recommend though is because of the holes in the side, make sure, not make sure, it's helpful that if you do it in a, in a space that's protected from the wind, that or a windscreen, because it is somewhat subject to cross breezes running through the holes. Uh, really all it does is enhance the flames, but you do lose a little bit of, oops, a little bit of heat when that happens, of course. All right, so 
the one I wanted to speak to the extended burn at this time, and what I did is over the summer I took this away camping with me, and I decided to just run it for like three hours straight, and I was burning both charcoal and wood in it, and I just kept piling the wood in and piling the wood in and piling the wood in, and to see what would happen. And yes, it did start to build up a layer of ash on the bottom. Not as much as I thought it might, but it was starting to get thick uh, on the bottom. What was interesting, it in no way hampered the performance of the stove. And the reason being is, as the ash started to build up on the bottom, airflow on the next set or row of holes took over. So I was still getting plenty of airflow coming in to where the actual flame was all the way up to the top. Now, I didn't let the ash build up all the way to the top, but I did let it build up halfway. So after three hours steady of burning wood and charcoal, it still was working perfectly fine. Now, you're saying, well, why could, couldn't it be better if you just had more holes in it, uh, allow more airflow on the bottom? Yes, you would get a hotter and faster burn. You would run the risk of hot coals running th falling through onto the ground. Of course, you're always going to have a wood stove, no matter what design it is, on a fire safe surface. However, one thing I did find about that is because the airflow coming through that fire grate is not extremely uh, high, like there's not a, not a lot of airflow coming through, it develops some great grilling coals because, uh, you know, that's the thing. When you're trying to grill with a wood stove, it's, you have to make sure you can develop coals. If there's too much airflow, coals will, will disappear too quickly. They won't last long enough and you'll have almost too much heat to cook with. I prefer to have something that burns a little slower and develops nice, steady, even heat than something that burns too quickly. Now, not to say that you can't get a lot of heat out of the stove, because if you preload it with vertically stacked sticks, uh, it will burn hot and fast. And you'll see when we demonstrate the stove in a few minutes time, just how well it will burn. Okay, so I wanna talk about use with alcohol. Okay, so I've repositioned the camera so that you can get more of a top-down look at the stove and I can show you how to set it up with alcohol. So when I first, the stove first arrived uh, from my friend, uh, I wasn't sure how I would use this with alcohol. And to me, that's quite a critical piece of any stove that I take with me is that if the wood is too wet, and the wood is wet today, but uh, if the wood is too wet or I just want to very, very quickly get some water on for a cup of tea or coffee, then I want to be able to use alcohol. So that's an important factor. But very quickly, I, ca I came up with a solution for this, and it is something that the um, manufacturer does recommend. Take the cross stands off. Take the base plate out, or the fire grate out. Now, for this, you're going to need either a couple of stainless steel skewers or titanium or aluminum tent pegs, anything that will fit through the holes on the side and go from side to side. So you notice that there are three set of holes uh, across the sides of the stove. Take your pegs, or in this case skewers, and slide them in the center set of holes, the outside ones on the center. Take the fire grate, drop it back in. Now I can take my Trangia burner, put that in. But if I set the pot stand on top, like I had it for wood, the pot gap is quite high. And uh, I also feel that not only is it a bit too high, but there's a bit of a heat sink effect that takes place from using the crossbars like this. They, they, they do absorb some of the heat and radiate it off, even though they are made of titanium and skeletonized. But I came up with a very simple solution. Take your two pot stands, lay them down on the stove like this. Now you can support a pot, no metal in between to absorb any of the heat, and you get a very respectable uh, burn time with alcohol. So the pot gap is one and a half inches, and I was able to, with two cups of cold water in my pot, get a boil time of seven minutes and 20 seconds. Yes, I know you can get faster, but uh, that's really, very good when you think about it. And what I like about this is that the burner itself is protected from the wind. So there is very little gap where wind can affect the flame and rob away any of your heat from reaching the bottom of the pot. Yet there's still plenty of air all the way around the sides and coming through the bottom of the fire grate to make sure that the alcohol st stove is getting enough oxygen. All right, now let's talk about use with pellets. 
So I have removed the fire grate and I'm going to drop it back down into the bottom of the stove. But there is one more little trick that I, I realized just recently. And this is both a pro and a con for the stove. Uh, I have tried to pick the stove up while there is uh, material in it burning so that I can move it. Now, you sh surely shouldn't have to do that. If you've chosen your spot well and uh, it's a fire safe surface, then there's really no reason to move the stove. But having said that, there may be a reason that you do need to move the stove. So a couple of things. The manufacturer has designed this. So uh, let me take it off of the pot stand. Has designed the original uh, siege stove cross members so that if the you can grab them from the side. You notice how this has a cutout notch on the side. If you grab them from that, from either end where that cutout is, then you can lift it without it falling apart. Uh, I don't think you'll do that while the stove is burning. In fact, uh, you know, I considered whether or not I'd try, but I'd take my fingers down, even with gloves on. No, it's just too hot. That wasn't, uh, wasn't going to work. So what's the problem? Well, let me show you what the problem is. So I have my fire grate inside. I have the cross member set up on the bottom and let's assume there's a fire inside. I left the fire grate behind. So the fire grate is just the same size as the bottom of the stove. So it's very easy for it to fall apart. And that is a bit of a con to me. Uh, I, I'm not happy with seeing that take place. However, there is a bit of a way to work around that using the same skewers or tent pegs. And this will work, this will help anyway. So this time I, I'm just for, to make it different, I'm gonna come in from the sides. I'm gonna take the bottom set of holes and run them through. completely through. Now, if I drop the fire grate in, it still sets in exactly as it was supposed to, because that doesn't raise it up all that much. Now, if I was to grab the stove with a pot grabber, I can lift the stove without losing any material inside because the fire grate itself is supported by those two skewers. I do leave the pot stands or the bottom pieces behind, unfortunately, but they're very easy to move with either a pair of uh, pliers like the, my, my Leatherman or a stick or something like that. If I had to move it a short way or they're titanium, they cool off really, really quickly. And then I can move this over and put it back on top while it's in operation. So it just drop right back on top. Just a small thing. Okay, so here's what I wanted to say about using pellets. This will work well with pellets as long as you don't overload it. So you, my recommendation is one cup of wood pellets. Hardwood pellets work the best. Uh, one cup of wood pellets and you'll find that there is plenty of oxygen. Could you use more? Yes, but I found it took much longer for the pellets to be engaged. They were more subject to downdrafts and being blown out. So it took quite a bit longer to, to really get a good heat going from the pellets. Besides, one cup of pellets was almost 30, 30 minutes, yeah, 30 minutes of burn time. So yeah, uh, no problem at all. The only thing is the distance from the fire grate to the top of the stove is such that you, you have more height than you really want. Your pellets are a bit too far away from the top of the stove if you're using the cross members in the, the original fashion, crossways on, on top of the stove like that. So it's a little bit, uh, of a too great a distance, but I came up with something. This won't work with every stove or in every pot, I should say, but you can take the cross members and drop them down into the stove itself. And because the stove narrows towards the bottom, then they're only gonna go down a short distance and they'll stop inside, as you can see. And now I can get a pot upwards of, of 10 centimeters, uh, not quite 12 centimeters, of course. I can you know, get a good size pot down on top of that and you'll have much closer uh, arrangement to the pellets and the heat and some protection from wind from the sides. Oh, great. So yes, it works well with wood. It works with alcohol. It works with wood pellets. What about charcoal? All right. So does it work with charcoal? Yes, it does. However, there is one uh, rule to that. I have used both chunk charcoal, natural hardwood charcoal, and briquettes, the formed briquettes. And to be honest, I don't like the briquettes. The briquettes will work. They are just very slow. The heat never gets that hot. 
and that's because of the restricted airflow. There is a limited amount of airflow coming through this. This doesn't work as well as some stoves do with briquettes because of the amount of airflow. However, it works just, seems to work just fine with the chunk charcoal, but if you have any experience with either or both of those, you'll know that uh, chunk charcoal tends to burn much hotter, much faster anyway. So in fact, that actually is what I would recommend for use in this because it slows the charcoal down a little bit and you get some excellent grilling temperatures. It will still bring water to a boil and you can still cook over it. In fact, I'm gonna be cooking over this, my lunch over this today in a few minutes with wood. But uh, yeah, it works really well with chunk charcoal. Okay, so we've talked about use with wood alcohol, wood pellets and charcoal, there's only one thing left to do and that is set it up in the fireplace and get it going. So I do have the Generation 3 flat pack stove from Siege Stove set up in my fire pit here for a couple of reasons. Of course, I do have a fire safe surface and I do have some wind protection. So let's get this fire started. So I'm going to do a bottom up burn today. I could do a top down burn. I like doing that quite often, but uh, my wood is, I think I mentioned already, we had a grid rainstorm overnight, which was wonderful that it lifted the fire ban, but at the same time made the wood soaking wet. So my wood, uh, I find if I do a bottom up burn, I get a small fire going, then I can start adding other wood on top of it. So even if it's a little bit damp, it will more likely catch on. So all I've done so far is dropped in some birch bark. I'm going to use a healthy amount of birch bark to get this going because it'll generate the heat to get the tiny little sticks that I have going as well. And that's what I'm using for to get this going is just tiny sticks. Uh, I have splits of wood while add as fuel, but just tiny sticks, not wood shavings or anything. So Simple, simple. Let's see. Nice little piece of birch bark. Even the birch bark I found was uh, struggling to get going today. All right. Not now, though. That's better. All right. So I have the crossbars on top already because uh, they're a lot easier to put on now than they are once it gets going. Yeah, some of these sticks are pretty damp. Let's see what happens. Yeah, one thing I really do like about this stove is just how much room there is around the sides of those pot supports to get sticks in. And that's true now, but it's even tr more true or you know, more helpful once you put a pot on and you just want to add extra fuel. As expected, it's smoky and a lot of flame from the birch bark, but that'll start to calm down once the wood catches on. Now you can see the dampness of the wood. I think I better wait before I add anything else. It is catching, it's just slow. This is no commentary on the functionality of the stove. This is just the wood itself. It is catching though. I just had to be a little patient. How are we doing down there? You know, I may have added too much birch bark. Cut off some of the airflow. Is that possible? Look at that. Yeah, sometimes birch bark doesn't uh, completely burn up and then you get this layer covering the holes on the bottom of a fire grate. And really all you need to do is kind of lift it a little bit like that. Let's put in a couple pieces of hardwood now. All right, I haven't done anything while the, the camera was off. I just uh, let the wood catch a little bit. It's only two minutes later. I thought it might take a bit longer, but no, it's catching on quite nicely now. Something I want to mention just as it catches on is that uh, uh, 
A phenomenon I noticed, especially with wood pellets, I can see it happening here now. I'm not sure I'll be able to show it to you, but because of the holes, the three rows of holes, when I was using wood pellets, I noted that uh, even though this is not a wood gas stove, it's not a double wall stove, there was still secondary combustion taking place as air was being drawn in through the holes all the way around the side and flowing over the surface of the pellets as they burned and leading to a more effective, more efficient burn and smoke-free burn of the wood pellets. It was really quite cool to see that happening. Yeah, I can see it going on down inside here a little bit with the wood right now. Okay, so that's pretty much engaged. I can get another piece of hardwood in there. Maybe, there we go, all right. And let me get my pot on. Put my kettle on and... So I wanted to show you that there was really no dampening effect at all from putting the kettle on top of the stove while it was going. Uh, you can get a much larger pot on top of this and it'll support the weight. It'll support a cast iron fry pan because I did that while I was out car camping. Uh, it'll support the weight. Um, the only smoke that I'm seeing is literally the resin that's on the side or the, or the creosote and soot on the side of the pot starting to burn off a little bit. And if you're interested, this is a, a new uh, kettle that I'm trying out. This is from Uberlieben, if it looks familiar. It is the Uberlieben Generation 2 Kessel, but this one's in titanium. And spoiler alert for this, I love it. It is just a wonderful little kettle or pot, you can be used either way. So look at the amount of heat and flame coming out of that stove right now. That is just working marvelously and virtually no smoke. All right, I am going to break away now to cook up myself some lunch and then we'll come back for a few closing comments. So what are my final thoughts on the Generation 3 flat pack stove from Siege Stoves? Well, it occurs to me that really this is two stoves in one. You get the complete package as you see it right here, which makes an excellent stove. We'll talk more about that in a second. But you also get the cross members, top and bottom, that you can use to create stove from other things like uh, coffee cans, food cans, uh, IKEA utensil strainer, all the things you could with the original Siege Stove members. Uh, I I like the fact that it's just so simple, so simple to put together. Yes, you do have to assemble it, but if uh, that doesn't bother you and it really doesn't bother me, then the advantages of that are, are numerous. One, all four panels are exactly the same. There's no right and wrong about that. The airflow in this is so well designed. I mean, I, I didn't realize just how much thought must have gone in to calculating the airflow with this. Because as I mentioned, it's not so great in airflow that it goes through wood at high volume, yet it produces a lot of heat because the airflow is not just through the fire grate on the bottom, it's through the sides as well. And this will generate a lot of heat, especially with those standoffs being that high off the top of the stove. Still, with the holes being as small as they are in the fire grate, it allows for some good grilling numbers down in the bottom. Uh, it, as I showed, it works well with wood, but as I demonstrated, you can set it up to work well with alcohol, you can set it up for wood pellets, and you can use it with charcoal, chunk, hardwood chunk charcoal. That's my recommendation, not briquettes. I mean, you can try them. I just didn't have the best success using briquettes in this. So, am I gonna buy one for myself? Already ordered it, it's on the way, and I am so happy for this. This will come out a lot. It's just that good, it's just that simple, and you can use it in so many ways. Is it perfect? No, it's not perfect, there are a few things. Now, I mentioned warping. I mentioned that, but it's not an issue. What's happened is over, huh, 15, maybe even 20 burns in this. Derek, thank you for that. I put a lot of use on this, but it really doesn't show it. Um, it does start to bow out a little bit. Now, I intentionally used it with the same sides facing in or out uh, for all those burns. And the reason is I wanted to see how it re would react. So I just kept using the dirty sides in. If I was really concerned about the tiny bit of bowing that's take place, I just flip the sides around and have the bowing on the outside and, uh, or the bowing on the inside, and then it would just come back to uh, true again after a couple of burns. So the warping has not been an impairment to its function at all. It may take a little bit more to set the top bars on. They just have to be pushed into place. They don't just drop on, but 
I don't see that as an impairment because once they're on, they're on. So what is the downside? Well, the downside, as I mentioned, is the fact that if you don't have any rods running through like I showed with the skewers, then if you have to move the stove, you're going to drop your entire contents out onto the ground. That would not be a good thing at all. So even with those rods running through, you haven't totally removed the issue, You but you have mitigated the risk of losing all of your fire onto the ground. You still have to pick up and move the bottom cross members afterwards. Uh, you know, maybe you're brave enough to reach down and grab onto these things at the bottom with a pair of gloves on. Oh, I know what I did try. I could use a pair of sticks, but I just wasn't consistent. So if I got down and I put a pair of sticks through either side and kind of wedged them open a little bit, then I was able to lift the stove up. It just it was a little tippy. It's not something I would recommend. You can give it a try. Try it empty. Try it with some stuff in it not lit and see if you're able to do that. I wouldn't do it with a burning fire unless I was able to consistently do it without anything uh, on fire inside of the stove. Okay, the pluses outweigh that one negative without a question. I can live with, the, with that bottom piece be, you know, not staying in unless you do something like I did with the skewers to keep it in. Other than that, yeah, this stove, or mine, when it arrives, will be going up with me a lot. You're, you will see it in operation with alcohol, you'll see it in operation with pellets, and you'll see it in operation with uh, charcoal at some point. Okay, if you have any comments on this stove, this being the Titanium Generation 3 flat pack stove from Siege Stove, designed and made in America, then uh, please put all those comments in the comments section below. If you have any questions, please put those in the comments section below. If you have any suggestions for future videos or stoves that if I can get my hands on, I will try, then put that in the comments section below. All right, that's enough for today. Get out and explore. Take that path, let's travel. It will make all the difference. Bye for now.